Good morning. Our call to worship is Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Amen. Amen. Father, the privilege we have and the joy we share as your children, welcomed by you as we enter your home on this Pentecost Sunday. Announcements, birthdays. Did you see all the birthdays in this thing? Yeah. Oh yeah, half the congregation got a birthday this month. So we have Nancy and we have Liv, Cindy, Alexis and Keith. So therefore we will sing happy birthday to you folks. <coughs> Who's gonna happy start? Birthday hey, to you. Happy birthday to you. May the Lord bless and keep you. Happy birthday to you. And anymore. <laughs> it took a whole lot of people to replace Shannon, didn't it? Um, there, as you notice on the back of your bulletin, there are virtually no announcements. Um, so therefore, I thought I'd have to do something to make sure that you had something to know. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, so therefore will be Lord's Supper, and I would like to read a devotion that I got about a month and a half ago. It goes as follows. In John 6, 57, Jesus tells the people that he is the bread of life, and whoever feeds on him will live forever. This is a strange teaching that of all of the people who heard it could not accept. Can you blame them? It is quite unusual for a teacher to say that whatever Whoever eats his flesh will live. Yet, this mystery that we cannot explain rationally is at the heart of the sacrament of communion, the Lord's Supper. Symbolically, we eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, because we accept that he is the one to whom God has given to provide us salvation and eternal life. He promises that the Spirit gives life and that the words he has spoken are full of the spirit and life. Even today, these words are hard to explain. They only make sense in the context of faith. Jesus' words are full of spirit and life. Help us not to be afraid or alarmed, but enable us to trust your word completely, to feed on you, and to receive the eternal life that only you can give. Lead us to prayerfully prepare to gather around your table next Sunday. This time I would like to lead you in a prayer of invocation. And for those visiting with us, I will start stop partly through there for a time of silent personal prayer. Shall we pray? Father, this morning we gather, keeping our minds silent and free from worldly thoughts, knowing that you are our Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Near the beginning of this service, we come with grateful hearts, seeking your hand of grace love and mercy. We are so privileged to be here in your presence and offer our prayers to you as we do so now silently in personal prayer. Thank you, Father, for listening to your children praying. Accept the praises in the psalms we will be singing and in our responsive reading. We ask the best blessing on Pastor Williams and the message, Back to the Future. Father, open our ears and hearts to receive the message and thereby learn how to improve, expressing our gratitude and love to you, our Savior. What a joy it is to be part of your family, to be able to share your love and fellowship and also the fellowship of our sisters and brothers gathered here. Holy Trinity, you are our creator, redeemer, giving us the joy of a, a promised resurrection and eternal life with you. Glory, honor, praise, and adoration we give to you in humble gratitude. And it is in Jesus, our dear Savior's name we pray. Amen. Our first song this morning is number 548, 
as a deer pant for water. We ask you to stand as you're able and we will sing that song. Father, we give sang, you alone are my strength and shield. I long to worship thee. Accept this offering as part of the joyful worship to you, since we also sang, I want you more than gold and silver. You alone are the real joy giver. Bless the hands that have given this to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Our responsive reading today is Psalm 103 verses 17 through 22. And I will lead you in the response of reading at that time, at this time. But from everlasting to everlasting, and the Lord's love is for those who fear him, and his righteousness is their children's children. For those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, Praise the Lord, his angels. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts. Praise the Lord, all his works. Amen. Next up, song is number 407. God has spoken by his prophets, and once again we ask you to stand as you are able.
senior moment. Anybody out there a senior? No seniors? Well, then you don't have to come up and do anything. All the way home in the back seat of the car, the boy was quiet. His father asked him three times what was wrong. Finally, the boy replied, the preacher said he wanted all of us brought up in a Christian home, but I just want to stay with you guys. <laughs> a little different note in his beautiful book, I Shall Not Want, Robert Ketchum tells of a Sunday school teacher who asked her group of children if anyone could quote the entire 23rd Psalm. A golden-haired, four-and-a-half-year-old girl was among those who raised her hand. A bit skeptical, the teacher asked her if she could quote the entire song. The little girl came up to the front of the room, faced the class, made a perky little bow, and said, The Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I want. <laughs> she bowed again and went and sat down. Robert said that may well be the greatest interpretation of the 23rd Psalm that he ever heard. Shannon gave us a story about John, little Johnny a few weeks ago, so we'll give you another one. Little Johnny started grade one and told his mom he no longer needed her to walk him the two blocks to school. After all, he was now growing up. Reluctantly, she agreed, but when talking with her neighbor across the street, Jessica said she would take her baby for a walk and keep an eye on Johnny. After a few day, days, Johnny was walking to school with Jimmy. Jimmy said, do you see that lady with the baby store? Is she following us? Oh yes, said Johnny. That's Shirley Goodness and her daughter Mercy. My mom prays for them every night in my prayer before bedtime. She always says, Shirley Goodness and Mercy shall follow him all the days of his life. Point is, children literally hear and interpret things. In Matthew 18, we read, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to them and placed the child among them. He said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I trust each and every one of you literally believes what you pray, God, and that God will answer all of them according to his will, his perfect will for our lives, though through his unbounding love and grace. We sometimes pray, but never really expect the prayers to be answered, but we pray them anyway. I encourage you to pray expectantly at all times. Let us pray. Father, give us faith like little children when we humbly bow in prayer before your holy throne of grace, peace, and love. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This time I have the privilege of leading you in the pastoral prayer. Oh, I guess before I do that, I should give a, an update on Ron for any of those that have not had it. I talked to Mark this morning. Ron is still in the hospital. He's still in a lot of pain. The problem is that uh, his pain meds also upset his stomach and make him feel bad. So as Mark said, he's not a very happy boy at this time. Um, but uh, she doesn't know when he'll be getting out at this point. Shall we pray? Your throne, O oh God, will last forever and ever. In the beginning, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Therefore, as your chosen people, we can rest assured in the joy of salvation we have received through the blood of the cross that we will celebrate next Sunday. What a blessing, what a gift divine we share as Christians around the world. The psalmist said, happy are those who put their trust in the Lord. Thank you, Father, for calling each of us into that relationship. We ask you through the working of the Holy Spirit to, to continue to expand our faith in you and feel your love and peace day by day. We see and hear day after day the hold Satan has on this world. We see it in wars, genocide, mental, physical, and racial abuse, governments causing hunger and not providing medical care for their people. We pray for justice. 
the end of warfare, the mind of Jesus to be in everyone and how they relate to those around them. We pray for world leaders, for all of those in leadership positions in Christian and secular, secular areas, and look for peaceful, that they may look for peaceful solutions to all situations. Father, once again, we look at our church family. We praise you for the good report from Arlene and Nicole. Be with those in mourning the loss of loved ones. Put your arms of comfort around them. Bless those in nursing homes and retirement homes or confined to their own homes. We pray for Irene, Bonnie, Lauren, Gladys, Don Kramer, Mary Lou, Faith, Rose, and Marilyn. May they very tangibly feel your love, your unbounding grace. Give them, the total, give them total peace and contentment. We ask a blessing on those under doctor's care who are just not feeling well. We pray for Emily, Henry, Doug, Roberta, Liv, Sam, Barb, Rena, Joyce, Ron, Mary Lynn, Sharon, Tyler, and any that we are not aware of. Lord, you know each and every one of them. You know what is required. Give comfort and peace to those who are terminal and give restored health to those in need of your healing touch. We pray for the Susies and the Van Husicums and all missionaries around the world. We encourage them in their walk with you as they proclaim the good news of Jesus. We ask a blessing on Dan and Pastor Shannon and give them protection and give protection to all of those traveling. Father, we pray for, CBO, for the CBOQ assembly, which will be taking place in a couple weeks. Be with all the delegates and the folks gathered there. We ask the blessing on our evangelism weekend coming up. Give us youthful insights on how to proclaim your name and reach hearts in need of your divine love. We ask the blessing on the rest of the service as we pray praise to you, our rock, our source of peace and joy. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. It is my privilege to introduce Pastor William Davis, or David Williams, it's time for me to go home, um, as he uh, comes to our pulpit and leads us in the rest of the service. you were introducing my uncle because I have an uncle, William Williams. Oh my goodness. Yes. Needless to say, we call him Bill. Top of the morning, please. Top of the morning to you. Ah, I have to write something down real quick. Something came to my mind while I'm over there. And if I don't write it down, my age and memory will uh, skip and I will forget it. Okay. Our scripture passage today is taken from the book of Hebrews and sort of a tradition with me when I'm visiting different churches because I never know what translation to use. And uh, though I have a variety of translations in my office, I, uh, I go and uh, pick up my, my favorite study Bible, which uh, was introduced to me some years ago. And uh, uh, you can get it on, on the computer free for, uh, at Bible.org. But it's called the Net Bible, and I like using it, and I like the extra helps they provide pastors if, you, if you're a pastor and you go to their site. So, since I'm here, I will get to use mine, and I know it won't be the same one that's up there. You'll have to bear with me. So our text today is from Hebrews chapter 1, 8 through 12. Hear the word of God. 
But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And a righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. So God, your God, has anointed you over your companions with the oil of rejoicing. And you founded the earth in the beginning, Lord. And the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you continue. And they will all grow old like a garment. And like a robe, you will fold them up. And like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never run out. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will challenge each one of us here by these, your words to us. I'll have to readjust things here. They have never yet made a pulpit big enough for me because I like, I like a desk up here, really what I like. And if, I, if, I, if I'm ever in a church where they have those little podiums, you know, with little things, I kill them. <laughs> there we go, I like this. My wife Gloria sends her greetings to you and uh, her apology for not being here today. Um, as we've got older, uh, she doesn't like traveling uh, a far, far afield. And so uh, she's praying for me, and, and particularly for you, uh, this morning. And uh, strangely enough, when I know that she's praying for me, the services tend to work better. Also, I send greetings from, uh, from Glamis Baptist Church. And I'm hoping that Dan and Shannon are having a really, really good vacation. No, they're not? They're helping your son and we just moved into a new house. <laughs> Oh, which one? They got two. Mark, which son? No, the eldest one. Oh, okay, okay. That could be fun. Yeah. Hey, it's easier when they're younger than when they get old. Because we collect more stuff. Did anybody get to London for the big affair? Not one of you. You didn't get an invitation. Did you know anybody that got an invitation? No, okay. Well, with a king on the throne now, the little plaque at the back there saying for king and country is even more true now, right? King and country, okay. If I had got an invitation, I'm sure mine was just missed in the mail somehow, but if I had got an invitation, um, I like old things. And I wouldn't be, I'm not talking about the king, but I, I like old things. And it's not that the, I would be wanting to see him being crowned the king so much as I would have liked to see the porphyry stones upon which he, they set his throne to go and crown him king. Over in uh, Westminster Abbey, give you an idea from a distance what it looks, sort of looks like, is this big pavement. And um, I have a book on it. If you want to borrow it afterwards, you're quite welcome to it because it's just one of those things that somehow found its way in my library. And then later on, you use it for a sermon illustration. And, uh, and I loan them out readily. Um, it's about, it's called the, the Hidden Meaning of the Great Pavement of Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey, back in the year 1269, give you an idea how old the pavement is. In the year 1269, uh, some, someone got it in their mind that, uh, that they should put this pavement there and they based it on patterns from, from uh, other cathedrals and churches and, and places over in Europe. And uh, they built this big 
the ornate thing, and um, it's a it's a tiled floor basically made out of precious and semi-precious, well, mostly semi-precious stones and uh, and other things, and. Uh, it is so old and so fragile over the years that they have this heavy, heavy carpet that beats any church carpet you've ever seen, that they lay over top of this, and then I think it's once a year, well, for a while there, they would only roll the carpet back if there was a new king or queen, or some real, real big special occasion, like someone died or something that, that, was, that was important in the country. But normally it's hidden from, the light, from views until some, some recent years. They decided once a year they'd roll the carpet back and people by, would throng in to see this thing because it's been hidden from eyes. And the, uh, the interesting thing about the, uh, the pavement is that back in the day, back in the day, um, churchmen and just regular people, scholars, Regular people, even the farmers in the fields, all believed that everything was connected. Everything was connected. All God's creation um, was was entwined, and so they, when they designed the pavement, they designed it to represent the cosmos and to uh, to show the uh, how they believe that God has made things in such a way that everything's connected. So it has a whole lot of swirls and things that, are, that all tie the whole thing together. And that they have a Latin phrase that goes around the whole thread thing, interwoven in it. And it is the whole gist of the Latin phrase is to remind those that are coming to church. Because back in those days, a lot of people were illiterate. And so the things they saw in church uh, taught them from the Bible. And it was to remind the people there that everything's connected. God has created everything. And everything God has created, the heavens and the earth, will someday come to an end. By God's decree, not man's. And so what I would have enjoyed seeing is where they put his throne. For when they went and crowned him. And I think the tradition was, I don't know if you can see it, you can look at it after. There's a big circle that is supposed to represent the, the, all, the total cosmos, the earth and everything. And it's in the middle with all these other things around it. And that is the traditional place to place his throne. To remind him that everything is connected and God's the originator of everything. And I think he might, I don't think he's necessarily a real godly man per se, or God-fearing man, but um, I'm, my understanding is that as he came into Westminster Abbey, um, he said, I have not come to be served, but I have come to serve. Noble words, if you, if you can live by them. When that was happening, I remembered I had this book, and so I dragged it out and, and was looking through it, and the, the initial germ for my message came from thinking about that. My neighbor lady, she stayed up, she got up at five in the morning, four in the morning, something like that, and watched the entire thing. Did anybody do that? Oh, you're not strong monarchist here. Oh, okay. Anyway, I'll keep that in mind. There is a back door I can run out. And so I, I got thinking about that. I knew it was coming here. And so I got thinking, trying to figure out something different I can bring. And I know it's Pentecost Sunday. And, but it's, it's still, I wanted something different. And so this idea came to me. And I was reading the book of Hebrews. And... Uh, it sort of jumped out at me. I had a professor one time, uh, oh, 45 years ago. Okay, I'm starting to get old. 45 years ago, I had a professor, and he turned to uh, the class 
And he said two things that have, that have stuck in my mind down through the years. And, and when you read Hebrews, uh, you can sort of see the truth of it. Actually, it permeates the whole Bible. He said, question everything. Question everything. In other words, you say, it's not that you're supposed to be one of these people that doubts everything. He says, question everything. There's a reason for that, because if you go and, and you listen to someone and, and they preach to you about a, a passage, and uh, you sit back and say, well, was he right? And you go home, you should go home and get your Bible out and read the passage and the ones before it and the ones, a ones after it, put it all together and see if maybe he was right, maybe he was wrong. You know, there's a, uh, there's a song by that, maybe, we were, maybe I was right, maybe I was wrong, or you were wrong. But anyway, uh, question everything he says. In other words, be a person that doesn't take everything for granted. You go and you look into things. It's the reason that science, uh, that scientists of old, who were many, many of them were Christians, uh, discovered things about science and about the, about the universe and about the earth and about the elements and about life itself because they saw something and they questioned. Why? You know, you know one of the first questions kids ask you when you go and tell them not to do something, they ask, why? You know. And the other thing my professor told me is, everything is religious. Everything is religious. And I got, I had to chew on that for a while. Everything is religious. And my professor, I had one, I was fortunate, we had one of those professors that he would go to the coffee shop um, later in the day and he'd sit down with the students and they could hammer them with any kind of questions they want. And he would elaborate on some of the things he taught in class he didn't have time to elaborate on. And, uh, and he would talk about things like everything is religious. And he says, the news that you choose to watch, whatever news channel that is, it, they are presenting a religious idea to you. You know, uh, remember Coke is it type thing? Is Coke really it? What's it? You know? Question, every, question everything, and everything is religious. Your advertisements, they, they present to you a worldview, and, uh, and they challenge you to accept their worldview, which is a religious thing. You all have a worldview. Our politics are permeated with religion because there's concepts behind what they're doing, and um, there's forces, there's a war taking place in Canada and the world, and we are a part of it, and often we're on the other side. We're on the winning side, but it doesn't seem we're, on the, we're the majority. Everything is religious. The books you read, the things that they try to tell you are on the bestseller lists. I was questioned, who decides what the bestseller list is? Everything is religious. The pavement was trying to go and tell people everything is religious. It drew me to the book of Hebrews. Why? And, and you have the, uh, across our the CBOQ, the, um, and, uh, and, and our local, what is it, Northwestern? I always get that wrong. Midwestern. Midwestern. We're not Northwest. We're Midwest. Midwestern. I guess it all depends where you're standing. Midwestern Association. Uh, a lot of us don't see a lot of kids in our, in our uh, churches. And Glamis is, is the same. Though I'm, I'm glad to see that the, uh, the generation is skipped for some reason. They're, they're having kids. A bunch of kids. And they don't like the way things are going in school. And they're starting to think that maybe they should bring their kids to Sunday school where their parents were trying to drag them off to before, and now they're starting to bring them in, which I'm quite grateful to see. Why do the youth, the youth, uh, not come back to church or leave the church? When Gloria and I were first in Glamis, we uh, were young and uh, full of energy, and uh, we had two young sons, and uh, we got thinking, 
know, what can we do in this little place called Glamis? And it was crawling with kids, we noticed. And, but none of them came to the church. And then a couple of the girls from the community came to us one day and says, there's nothing to do in Glamis. Have you ever kids you ever tell, tell you that? There's nothing to do here, especially if you're in the country. There's nothing to do. And, and they said, could you help us with that? And we said, well, if you can find six more kids, we'll go and try to come up with a program. Ah, you go and you say something like that. It's like a bargain made. The girls kept bringing in kids, and they were young people, so they weren't the little kids. They were the young people of the community. And Glamis is one of those places that there's three school districts all met there in the, the crossroads of Glamis, and there's only two roads in Glamis, you know. It, it's a crossroads. And it's a ghost town, actually. Technically, it is on the ghost towns of southern Ontario. But uh, there, it was crawling with kids. They all, all of them started coming to the church. And at one point, um, I think there was something like 50 kids of different ages coming to the church. And we were frantic going around trying to figure out what we're going to do with this. And the reason they were coming is because we were teaching them things that they had not heard before. And, uh, but... Eventually they grew up and they went out and they had kids and their kids had kids. We're, we are getting old. And um, uh, lo and behold, some of the kids are bringing their kids back to church. And I, Gloria and I pray that it's because of some of the things we taught them in those early years. We don't have the energy to run a program like that anymore, but it was fun while it lasted. It was a lot, a lot of learning in, in all aspects. Why do the kids uh, stop, stop going to church? Why do they? And I was, I was doing some reading on this, and one author said, it's because of hypocrisy. I said, who's, you know? And I got thinking, I remember someone one time telling me the reason he, and if he was an adult, didn't go to church is because he said, it's full of hypocrites. And I, I told him at the time, there's always room for another one. But uh, he didn't like that answer. But um, he, I think the author that, that pointed this out in the book I was reading was right. It's the hypocrisy of the people that are in the church. And you say, well, how are we hypocrites? Because by intonation, then he's saying, I'm a hypocrite. He's, uh, and, and all of us are hypocrites. And we're in church. And what he's trying to say is, you say you say you believe the Bible. We all teach that, right? We all teach that God, that this is God's word, right? And everything in it is true, right? Because God doesn't lie. He even says it in there. God cannot lie. And so, so this is God's word. We say it's God's word. We teach it's God's word. We tell them in Sunday school and in the pulpit that this is God's word. But do we live and act and speak like it's God's word. The truth of the story, the truth of the matter is, is that we don't. You say, well, how don't we? How don't we? All right, I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I, I like having feedback other than you're just looking at me, okay? I like having feedback or chuckles, you know, I, I like chuckles, but... I, I like answers on this one. And the louder it is, the more happy I am. I used to be in the southern states, and they were not quiet in the pulpits. All right. Who created the heavens and the earth? All right. Good, good. Okay, now you're starting to catch it. Okay. Who made all that lives? God. Right, okay. Who made men, mankind, male and female? God. Oh, no, he actually made Pardon? He made Adam. Yeah, and then? A Adam is man. Right, and that mankind. And then he made Eve. So he made mankind, male and female. Right? God did that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who determines which one you are? 
does. Oh, does that mean does uh, does that mean that I can uh, say I, I had two boys and I decide I wish I had a girl and so I'll just take one and dress him up like a girl and and say this is my daughter. Is that right? No, because God determines which one you are. Who determines right from wrong? I do. Who alone can destroy the earth? God's the only one. Who determines the seasons? God. Ah. Who determines, all right, if God determines the seasons, if it's warmer one year than it was the year before, who determined that? God. God does that. Not man. God does. Who judges all men and kings and princes and prime ministers? God. Okay. Who established marriage and honored it as something that's between a man and a woman? Okay. Now, can you see how if you say this is the Word of God, and you believe this is the Word of God, and you go and tell other people, your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, or the guy you have coffee with over in Tim Hortons, you tell them something else, you're a liar. You're either lying that you said this is the word of God, or you're lying because you know that the Bible says it's different and you really believe it's different and you're going and saying what everybody wants to hear so you get along. book of Hebrews begins, and we don't really know who the author of Hebrews is. I find that fascinating. Don't you like mysteries? I love mysteries. The Bible's full of mysteries. You know? Where, when did Job live? Mm. Before or after Abraham? I think it was before. But it was after the flood. So in those years in between, a guy by the name of Job lived. I like mysteries. Book of Hebrews is a mystery because we don't know who wrote it and you won't find out till you get to heaven. And I don't think it's going to be the first question out of your mouth when you get to heaven. Oh, I'm here. Who wrote Hebrews? I don't think it's going to be the first thing out of your mouth. But you can find out later. It begins by saying this. After God spoke long ago in various portions and in various ways to our ancestors through the prophets, in these last days he has spoken to us in a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he created the world. The son is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. And so when he had accomplished cleansing for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, Thus he became far better than the angels, as he has inherited a name superior to theirs. Author of the book of Hebrews, and it's in our scriptures, which means it's the word of God, says that God the Father created the world through the Son. Someone asked me for a, a title for my message today, and, and I said it's... Uh, I, I rarely give uh, a title for my messages because my mind wanders on things and you never know exactly how it's going to turn out until you get there. I said, okay, back to the future. Back to the future. Which hopefully entices you to look at it. The book of Hebrews answers these questions like uh, what will come of us as a nation as a people, as a church, God knows. And God has established it in eternity. And eternity past guarantees eternity future, back to the future. You want to know where we're going as a nation or as a church, or what will happen to us 10, 5, 10, 20 years down the road or 50 years down the road. The answer to that 
is guaranteed in the past. So if you want to learn where the future is going to be or where it's going to go, you have to go back to the past. And the author of Hebrews takes us to the past as our guarantee for our future. When the Father says of the Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. What does that tell us? That tells us that there's two, at least two personages in the, uh, in the Godhead. We know there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All separate, but all God. Like the, uh, the medieval world taught that in churches by that little shield you used to see in some, ch some churches and you still find, sometimes on pulpits, I don't know if this one's got one. But some of, the, some of our old pulpits, even in the Baptist church, have this shield on there and it has three circles, one in this corner, one in this corner, one in this corner, and a little line that goes to each one of them and then a circle in the middle which each one of the circles has a line going to. That's the, that's the um, heraldic um, shield of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all God, but the Father is not non-est, not, isn't, isn't the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son, you know? And that was teaching the Trinity in church. Hebrews begins when, when the Father speaking, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. He's saying that the Son is God. God the Father addresses the, God the Son as God. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So he's teaching two things, or three things. There's at least two personages. And they communicate, and that uh, the Son is God, and that the Son's throne is eternal, forever and ever. And he says, in a righteous scepter, thinking of the crowning of the, of the king over in England, he was presented with this big scepter. And the scepter is in the form of a mace which it, you usually take into battle with you to, uh, because everybody's wearing armor, there's nothing worse if you've got a tin hat on and someone hits it with another piece of iron and you rattle around inside them. And that's a mace and it shows your power and your authority. He says, and a righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. The son's rule is in righteousness. In other words, there is right and there is wrong and God establishes which is which. And actually has a curse for those that call right wrong and wrong right. A righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. His rule is righteous. And he says, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Now, if we are supposed to live our lives as Christians in such a way as to be followers of Christ, which is what a disciple is, a follower of the Master, we are his servants, we are his slaves, actually, because he bought us with his blood, then what he loves, we should love, and what he hates, we should hate. Which means when we are Oh, we are entering June. What is June? I, you know, I know you hate to admit it, but what is June set aside by our society for? Gay month. You know? That's what it is. Anyway, and there's nothing righteous about it. There's nothing right about it. But the son, it says here, the son loves righteousness and he hates lawlessness. When you see the lawlessness in the States and here in Canada, God hates that. The son hates that. He continues, so God, your God, has anointed you with 
over your companions with the oil of rejoicing. The Father honors the Son, and we are honored because we are a part of the Son, and we should honor the Son, and by honoring the Son, we're honoring the Father. He continues and says, You founded the earth in the beginning, Lord, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Remember going back to what I was asking before. Who created everything? God did. Now when we go and teach that evolution is the way everything happened and, and we latch on to the latest philosophy that says, out of nothing, there was nothing, and then there was a singularity, and there was a big bang, and everything came out of that. And over eons of time, non-life became life. And out of that life, everything else came. And so, so if I go and follow my ancestral lines back far enough, I'll find a newt or something. If you teach that to your children, then you are denying this, and you're being a hypocrite. I, um, I live on the shores of Lake Huron, outside of uh, King Carver. And one of the things I, like, I learned a long time ago is that when I go for a walk along the beach, well, it's not a beach, it's for a rocky shore. When I walk along the rocky shore, I do not walk like this because for one thing, I'll trip over a rock. For another thing, I won't see what I'm walking on. And I have learned over the years that as I walk along, you can find fossils. And in fact, it's about every second time I go out, I come back with a fossil. So I've become a collector of fossils. I even have one at home that looks like the end of a femur or a human being, except it's stone. But you can see all the cellular makeup from that. Now, if I were to take that to a scientist today or a university, they'd tell me how many millions or billions of years old this thing is. And I find fossils of sea creatures, and I find fossils of bigger things. Like I have a vertebrae at home that's that big around. Now, whatever critter that came from, and it's been crushed, too, so there's been a lot of pressure, and it's big, and it's a vertebrae. And I don't know what beastie it was, but it was a big one. And I have other things, like I had to find something that could fit in my pocket. This piece of amber, it's stone. People tell us this is millions of years old because it was tree sap that uh, somehow got caught in something that turned it into stone. Okay. If we teach our kids and our grandkids that things are millions and billions of years old, we are denying this and we are falling into that trap of the devil of being a hypocrite and denying. Well, remember, what was this temptation to Eve? Has God truly said? Remember? Did God really say? Putting doubt in their mind. We can't afford that in this day and age in which we live. You, speaking of Jesus, created the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. In other words, the one that builds a house has authority over the house. Not the house has authority over the builder. Jesus built the house. Then he says, they will perish. But you continue. The seasons will continue as long as the earth exists. And the earth will exist as long as God determines it will exist. No amount of mumble jumbo about um, ah, us worrying about the climate and saying there's too many people in the world and we should go and cut down the population of the world so that the world would be a better place. We're a virus upon the world. There's people, a lot of people that have believed that. And they're the ones that are looking around at those of us that are getting older and saying, they have a word for us, did you know? We're called useless eaters. Isn't that insulting? 
We're useless eaters. We're people where we don't provide anything meaningful to the way things are going and probably don't vote along the way we should be voting and don't agree with the things that we're supposed to agree with. And so we are a burden upon our society. And, and they have a special maid service for you. They will perish, the world and the heavens, but God will continue. Jesus will always be Jesus because he is God. And because we're a part of him and we are where he is, we too will continue. The world, in other words, they, the heavens and the earth. I always liked this passage, the picture of it. I, I, I come from a family of artists and we, we look for things like that. And, and they will grow old like a garment. And like a robe, you will fold them up. And like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never run out. Climate change is not going to go and destroy the world. Atomic war will not destroy the world. Because only God will determine how long the world lasts. And when the time comes, he'll fold it up like it was an old robe. I got tired of patching that thing. Fold it up and put a new robe on. Till that day, the world will continue. Which means we will continue as well. And, and we don't need to worry about what man's going to do with this old cosmos because it's not in his hands to do. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. There used to be a song back in the 60s, I think it was 60s or 70s. Remember the words, uh, what will be will be? Que sera, que sera, que Anybody remember that one? Okay, see, some of you were young at heart like me. Yeah, good music, remember? What will be, will be. And it's in God's hands. The future's not ours to see. We have hints, we got glimmers, we got, but we have hope because we have hope in Jesus Christ. The psalmist saw the world in which he was living in and saw the turmoil and the uncertainty. And he declared that uh, in Psalm 11, verse 3, when the foundations are destroyed, what can the godly accomplish? This here, the Hebrew, the book of Hebrews, was talking about foundational thoughts, foundation that the world was created by God through the Son. I love that. They answered. All right. That's what we need to remember and that's what we need to continue to teach. When Jesus died. The creator of all, think about that, the creator of the universe died, shed his blood for you and I, that we, through faith in him, will have eternal life. And so no matter what happens to the world, We'll still be here, or somewhere, but we will be, is the whole point. I was trying to find a proper benediction, and I liked some of the silly things that happen, even on our television. Anybody remember Star Trek? Anybody admit that you really like watching Star Trek? No, but, okay, someday, all right, remember Spock? Did you know Spock was Jewish? Did you? Spock was Jewish. And they used to do things back in the day, back when they were writing Star Trek, and they, they didn't plan things out real well. That's why they had all the bloopers in the, in the first thing when they had the little short thing on TV. And they would go and say, uh, oh, we need something for tomorrow. Uh, you take care of it. And you go home and go, and they turned to Spock, when he was being introduced as a clean, uh, as a um, whatever he was, but uh, 
And they said, come up with a special sign that will be, will attribute to you as, as, uh, as spot. And he, he got thinking, and he, what came to his mind, what kept coming to his mind, is the old ironic blessing. And I can't do it with my fingers. Remember he did, yeah, there it is, something like that. Remember that? Remember that? You know what that was? That was the high priest in Judaism would go and make that sign when he'd do the ironic blessing. And so remember he came back with, be well and prosper, remember? What do you do with this? Which is sort of taken from the ironic blessing. Receive the blessing. May the Lord richly bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh, I'm supposed to leave in the special music. Please, turn to number 414, and I know you're not going to do that because it's right up there. It's all rise and sing together. Um.